This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. My name is Nigella Hilgarth, and I'm the executive director at the aquarium at um, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego, and it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. David Hilton. Well, now, Dave is an isotope geochemist, and I'm going to let him tell you what that means. He's a professor of geochemistry in the Geosciences Research Division at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. And he was born in Bangor, Wales in the U UK, and as I'm partly Welsh as well, I'm delighted. <laughs> and he received his bachelor's in geochemistry from the University of Liverpool, and his master's in hydrogeology from the University of Liverpool, and then he did a PhD in isotope geochemistry from the University of Cambridge, and he told me that he did that work in Iceland, and that's when he realized he wanted to move his research to more tropical areas. <laughs> and he has since worked in some wonderful parts of the world, which I'm sure he'll tell us a bit about. So he um, came to, to Scripps um, as a postdoctoral researcher uh, in uh, 1986 to 88, and then he um, went to the uh, Free University of Berlin, and then the Free University of Amsterdam, and then he returned to Scripps as a professor, as a faculty member, in 1996. And he currently serves as the director of the Geosciences Research Division. And so please join me in welcoming this very distinguished scientist, David Hilton, for his talk entitled Rift, Geologic clues to what's tearing Africa apart. Thank you, Nigella, for that uh, lovely introduction. And I'm hoping that by the end of the talk, you'll know what an isotope geochemist is. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about Africa and geological and geochemical clues to what's happening in East Africa in particular. What's tearing Africa apart? And the focus of my talk are on two gases, helium and neon. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with what helium and neon uh, are used for. They're used for, obviously, parties, <laughs> which we all enjoy, and they are used for advertising, for shop fronts and whatever. But today I'm going to show you what a isotope geochemist does with helium and neon, uh, which is very different from these two um, uses of, of these gases. So let's focus on, on Africa and just a little bit of a reminder about plate tectonics. The, the, Earth's, uh, the Earth's surface is, is covered by tectonic plates which move around uh, relative to one another. And we're very familiar here in California about these tectonic plates. Presently, we're standing on the Pacific plate and we don't have to go very far to get to the American plate. We just need to go to the Salton Sea and that's where the San Andreas Fault is, and that's the plate boundary. And beyond the Salton Sea, as we go into Eastern California, we're on the American plate. Well, what we have here is the African plate, and it's really divided into two, the, the Nubian and the Somali plates. And as you can see, we have this rift down here in East Africa, but the rift is not complete. We haven't split up Africa yet into separate Somali and Nubian plates. So the rifting is ongoing. And this here, which is going to be the East African uh, Rift Valley, is basically the plate boundary. So let's focus in on this plate boundary. What we have here is the Nubian and the Somali, Somalian plate. And just to the north, we have the Arabian plate. So what we have here is the juxtaposition of three separate kind of microplates meeting at this point here, which is called a triple junction. 
And if we follow the plate boundary to the south and the southwest, this is the plate boundary split in Africa. So what we'll have is these two plates here and here forming different land masses eventually. As we go further south, we see it's discontinuous. The plate boundary finishes here in this region of the so-called Kenyan Dome. But on the far side, on the western side of the Kenyan Dome, there's another split, a plate boundary. And it terminates down here, and this is Lake Malawi. So we have a kind of a discontinuous plate boundary system. And it's the plate boundaries which really define the very famous East African Rift and the East African Rift Valley. So what we have over here is the so-called Western Branch and the Eastern Branch. And in the middle here in Ethiopia, we have another part of the Rift Valley. So that's the kind of tectonic background to the region. And these plate boundaries, um, they, they diverge, they come apart in response to uh, activities going on in the Earth's mantle. So when we think about the plates moving apart, it's important to realize that these are so-called lithospheric plates. They comprise the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. So what we have illustrated here is the lithospheric plate of the African plate. And uh, it's moving laterally to the side. It's the solid part of the plate at the Earth's uh, surface. So it's rigid, moves apart in a rigid manner, and it's underlain by mantle, which flows. And we refer to this as the asthenospheric mantle. It moves and it convex. So this asthenospheric mantle uh, moves towards the plate boundary. As the plate boundary moves apart, we produce new crust. And eventually, in this region, we'll have new oceanic crust and a new ocean. Now, as these plates move apart, we form rifts. And there are a number of consequences of this rifting. What we can see here is the asthenosphere making its traverse towards the surface, forcing the plates apart. And as the plates are, mov are moved apart, we have this downthrow area, the actual rift. And it's blown up in, this, in the bottom diagram here. We have the formation of the rift valley due to faulting here and here, these are normal faults as the uh, lithosphere moves laterally away from the central rift valley. And we have these tectonic scarps, these kind of cliff walls bounding the rift valley. Eventually, as we become more mature and the, uh, the lithosphere moves further and further away, we have volcanoes and earthquakes as this asthenospheric mantle moves closer and closer to the surface. So these are the consequences of rifting. And when we go to Africa, we see these consequences very clearly. So we have faulting and formation of the Rift Valley. Here in Kenya, we have the fault scarps. We have different generations of fault scarps as, those lithosphere, as that lithosphere has moved laterally away. We're on the valley floor here, uh, the so-called Rift Valley. And we see these very clear fault scarps. We also have lithospheric thinning. As that asthenosphere gets closer and closer to the surface, it basically thins out the crust. The crust is moving laterally away. And indeed, in this area, the asthenosphere gets very close to the surface and produces oceanic crust, just like here in the Red Sea and in the Gulf of Aden. So we're turning that lithosphere into oceanic crust. And we have these mass outpourings of flood basalts as a consequence of volcanoes. Ete Ale is a famous volcano in northern Ethiopia. It's one of only a few volcanoes worldwide which has a permanent lava lake in the crater. So as lava is brought towards the surface, it basically forms a lake in these craters. It loses heat, radiative heat, to the surface, but it's continuously replenished from below. So the lava um, sorry, the magma remains in a liquid state in these craters. And another spectacular example of volcanism in the Rift Valley is Aldo Inyo Lengai volcano in Tanzania. So this is the one example worldwide where the lavas are composed of ca carbonatitic uh, minerals. Most, or just about, sorry, all other volcanoes emit lavas with silicate minerals, 
This is the only volcano presently erupting uh, carbonate minerals. So we'll come back to Lengai in a little while. And finally, we have earthquakes. As that magma moves towards the surface, it fractures the lithosphere. Also, we have strain accommodated as the plates move apart, and we have earthquakes occurring in the Rift Valley. This is an example from December 2009 at the northern end of Lake Malawi, right at the southern tip of the rift. So we have all these uh, consequences of the rifting process. And when we think of the East African Rift Valley, it's described as an active rift. In other words, we have perturbations going on in the Earth's mantle, which is movement of the asthenosphere into the lithosphere. It's thermally eroding the lithosphere lithosphere, it's thinning it out, and we have magma injection and the formation of both volcanoes and an uplifted dome. You can see the dome here. The other type of rifting which occurs is so-called passive rifting, where what we have here is the forces of the plates moving uh, dictating the show. They, we have extension. We do have some thermal erosion, but nothing like the case when we have a mantle plume of a sphenosphere. And in this case, we don't have any volcanism. So East Africa is a very good example of an active rift. And I mentioned in the last uh, couple of slides this updoming of the crust. And when we look at the topography of East Africa, we see very nice examples of that updoming. Up what we have here is the Ethiopian dome. And what we have down here is the Kenya dome. And these are topographic highs, the high plateau of East Africa. In between, there's a depression. It's about a 500 kilometer depression where we lose elevation of about 1,000 odd meters or more. So we have almost two bullseyes here and here, the Ethiopian Dome and the Kenyan Dome. And all the action is really in the mantle which produces these domes. And, and that's really the subject of the talk. What's going on in the mantle to produce these domes? So how do we get to the Earth's mantle? You know, we live on the crust. The mantle is below us at, at different depths. We need to access the Earth's mantle. And particularly if I'm going to talk about helium and neon, these are gases which are in the Earth's mantle. So we can take advantage of the fact that volcanoes sample the mantle and act to transfer those gases from the mantle to the Earth's surface. So when we think about geothermal fluids, and, and people will be, I think, aware of geothermal fluids in Mammoth, for example. We have these hot waters or mud pots. We have high, steam, high temperature steam fumaroles. We have ground waters. These are all rainwater or fluids, meteoric fluids, which go into the Earth's crust are recirculated back to the surface and bring volatiles with them. And those volatiles really come from magma. Now, magma, when it reaches the Earth's surface, forms volcanoes and volcanic rocks. And we can look for lavas, which are the solid uh, products of magmas reaching the surface. We can go after scoria, when a, a volcano erupts, a material is thrown into the air, it freezes, in the air, so, sorry, it solidifies in the air. It's molten when it comes out, it solidifies in the air and falls back to the ground. We can go after scoria and we can go after mantle xenoliths. And all these different media allow us to sample these volatiles which ultimately come from the Earth's mantle. A word about sampling. Volcanoes, we, we know volcanoes erupt and they're very active. When volcanoes are in this state, we don't sample them. We don't go anywhere near these <laughs> volcanoes. So we go and we check with the local um, seismologists, the local geologists, the local people in the villages. And if there's any shaking or any activity, you know, forget it. We're not going to climb that guy. And we only do it when, when it's perfectly safe. So I did mention that volcano, Aldo Inyo Lengai. It's in northern Tanzania. It's in the eastern part of the rift. And it's one uh, very good example of some of the activities we, in, we indulge in when we go to these fantastic places. We, we hike these volcanoes. Now, not every um, sample that we take occurs at the top of the volcano. So 
conveniently, some of these uh, fumaroles and some of these hot springs occur at the bottom of the volcano, so that's very easy. But occasionally on a field trip, we might have to do a couple of hikes. So you can see how steep this is. It's really quite a walk. Uh, we start walking about midnight because we don't want to walk in, in the tropical sun. We try and get to the top about dawn, so we have the full day to work at the top. Uh, this is a spectacular view, view of Lake Natron on the border between Tanzania and Kenya. I, I think you might be able to make out our guide who's lying there having a snooze. So we stop many times en route to the, to the top. And then when we do get to the top, we're rewarded by usually spectacular views. So um, this is the crater rim of the, that particular volcano. Uh, the spectacular views looking across, I think you can just about make out the volcano over my left shoulder. This is Mount Kilimanjaro, it's about 100 kilometers away. So that was a, a nice bonus of being at the top. And then if we look down into the crater, this is what the crater looks like. And these uh, vents here are regions where there's magma. So we're without, you know, without binoculars, we can look into these vents and see the magma just sloshing around. So really quite exciting. Well, we, we don't go up for the view necessarily. We go up to, make, to collect samples. And at the summit of Aldo in Inyo Lengai, we had these steam fumaroles on this bed of outcrop here. And this is, uh, this is me sampling the fumaroles. We have a titanium rod, which we put into the, into the fumarole. And we have evacuated glass bottles where we collect the samples. We evacuate in the lab take these bottles to the field, collect these gases, hopefully with as minimal air contamination as possible, and transfer it back into the lab for uh, analysis. We also go after hot springs, bubbling hot springs, and you can see this particular example here, we have CO2 bubbles. The major gas released from a magma is CO2 and water. Well, when we have uh, local meteoric water, we're not gonna see the water from the magma, but we are going to see the CO2. And this is the carbon dioxide which is bubbling up, and we put a funnel into this and we collect the gases in our glass bottles. This water is supercharged with carbon dioxide, and over time we've produced, this area has produced these fantastic travertine deposits. And uh, we can see all these various uh, colors in the travertine. We also sample uh, mazooka, and this is really quite rare. Um, what they are is CO2 vents, and the CO2, unlike in a hot spring, the whole system is very cold. And um, so what we have is an orifice here, and if you look very carefully, we have a real very large flux of CO2 pumping out of this hole. We're sampling it with our titanium, and we're taking the CO2 quite a long way away before we sample the CO2 in the bottle. And these can be quite dangerous, particularly in regions where there are depressions because the CO2 being heavier than air collects in these depressions and if people walk into these, these areas, well, they, they're going to asphyxiate. So uh, you have to be very careful with these uh, mazookas. But again, they represent a, a way that we can sample the gas. In addition to all these various fluids, we can sample lavas. These are quite old lavas. You just need a big guy and a big sledgehammer <laughs> to, uh, to attack these lavas, and then we have manageable pieces to, uh, to bring home. This is an example of that scoria, which I, I uh, described. We, we go after uh, quarries, and indeed here we have a very nice layering of this scoria. This is material which has just come down from a volcanic vent and built up these huge amounts of material. And the reason we go after the scoria and the lavas is, is the following. We're after the minerals that occur in these rocks. And the minerals in particular, which are useful for us, are olivines. These green minerals here are olivines, and these uh, darker minerals are pyroxenes. And inside those minerals are very small inclusions, little fluid inclusions. And when we transfer the minerals or the rocks back to the laboratory, our students pick the uh, minerals, we put them in a vacuum system, and we crush the, uh, the minerals. That acts to release the volatiles into our vacuum system so we can analyze the gases. I did mention xenoliths. These are so-called peridotite uh, xenoliths. They're composed mainly of these crystals, olivine and pyroxenes. And what they are, they are part of the mantle lithosphere. So 
they are the mantle, they represent the mantle, and they've been torn away from the lithosphere by these magmas. Now, the magmas are obviously solidified at the surface, so it's a lava. And you can see the xenoliths. They occur in these lavas. And you can see a very sharp boundary between the actual xenoliths and the lava. That implies that the transfer process was very quick. This was liquid. And if it was liquid, it would react with the xenolith. And you can see that it hasn't really reacted. They're very sharp boundaries. So as soon as that bit of the mantle was torn off, it got transferred to the surface very quickly and solidified. And we have, in fact, a whole xenolith. So now we get down to the gritty, nitty gritty, the noble gases and helium and neon. So take you back to high school, noble gases, group eight of the periodic table. They're also known as the inert gases. There are a bunch of noble gases. I'm only going to talk about helium and neon today. And they are very useful to geochemists because they are chemically inert. They don't react with anything. So we don't have to worry about chemistry. But in terms of helium, and we'll start with helium, we'll move on to neon a little bit later, they occur in different isotopic forms. People will be aware of carbon-14 and carbon-13. These are two different isotopes of carbon. It's the same with helium. Helium has two isotopic forms. The blues are the electrons and the reds are the protons. So they balance each other out and the, the, uh, the atom is electrically neutral. This big guy here is a neutron, whereas helium-4 has two neutrons, helium-3 has one neutron. So there's a mass difference and consequently we refer to it as helium-3 and helium-4 and in nature the ratio of helium-3 and helium-4 vary. And we have two isotopes. Really, it's just reflecting one atom has uh, one neutron and the other has two neutrons. So there's a mass difference in helium. Now, when we think about helium, um, this gas that fills our balloons, we have two sources or two components of helium on Earth. We have primordial helium. When the Earth formed 4.5 billion years ago, it trapped helium from the solar nebula as the Earth formed. And what we want to know is the helium-3 to helium-4 ratio at that time. And we can look at the solar wind or meteorites to get that kind of information. And the ratio of helium-3 to helium-4 is 280 times the ratio we presently measure in air. Now, when we look at air, there's a lot more helium-4 in air than helium-3. There's about a million times more helium-4 than helium-3. The actual number is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 6. We don't really want to repeat that number all the time, so we're going to say air is 1. So initially, the Earth started with a ratio 280 times what, what it was or what it is in the present-day atmosphere. Superimposed upon that primordial helium is radiogenic helium. This has been produced since day one all the way up uh, to and including the present day. So produced over Earth history. And these are natural radioactive decays from parents like uranium. We produce helium-4 atoms. So we have decay of uranium and thorium. We have a very small amount of helium-3 produced by a reaction. And the ratio of helium-3 to helium-4 is 0 0.02 times the present day atmosphere. So what we see is a huge isotopic contrast between this primordial helium and this superimposed radiogenic helium. Now, if the Earth was a completely closed system, we start with this, we're producing this, the ratio is gradually decreasing with time. Uh, and the beauty of isotopes is that if we mix up these two different sources of helium, and let's say we mix it 50-50, well, this is virtually zero, this is 280. A 50-50 mix between these two components would give us a value of 140 times the atmospheric value. So we can do these very simple mass balance uh, calculations with isotopes. So we have two sources of helium. And in the Earth today, and this is a picture of how we think the Earth looks like. This is the core, this is the mantle, and we have this vi very thin veneer of crust. Um, we think that the Earth works by mantle plumes coming from the deeper mantle and interacting with the surface. So when we look at helium on the Earth, air is, is this value one. The crust 
is that radiogenic helium component, 0.02, because the uranium and the thorium is really concentrated in the crust. And as we move into the Earth's interior, the subcontinental, the lithospheric mantle, is about six times the value uh, of air. The upper mantle, and we give it this acronym DMM, depleted mauve mantle, is about eight times. And plumes from the deepest part of the mantle greater than 20 times the atmospheric value. So the deeper we go into the Earth, the greater proportion we have of that primordial helium compared with the radiogenic helium. So the mixture is weighted towards the primordial component, and consequently, the ratio is higher. Now, wherever we are in the mantle, the lower mantle, or the plumes, or the upper mantle, or the uh, lithospheric mantle, the ratios are all higher than the atmospheric value, and it contrasts with the crust, which is lower than the atmospheric value. So we have a nice label on our helium, in terms of its isotopic composition, of where the helium comes from. And when we collect all these wonderful samples in the field, we bring them back to Scripps, and we process them to make this measurement of helium-3, helium-4 ratios. This is a preparation line where we collect these, uh, we input the volcanic gases, we clean them up, any reactive gases we uh, get rid of by chemical reactions, so we get rid of the CO2, we get, out, get rid of the nitrogen and the oxygen, and we only leave the inert gases, and then we separate them cryogenically. So we have different traps at different temperatures, and ultimately what we have is pure helium left in the line, which we inlet into this mass spectrometer. And the mass spectrometer can measure the helium-3, helium-4 ratios. And just to give you an idea of what we're trying to measure, if we think about those little olivine crystals, a typical amount of helium-4 in an olivine, one gram of olivine, is about 10 to the 10 atoms. Now, it sounds a lot, but there's a lot less helium-3. Remember, we have a million times less in air. So if the 3-4 ratio is 8, then the concentration of the helium-3 is about 300,000 atoms for that one gram. So you think, well, that's a lot of uh, helium-3. We can make that measurement really quite easily. However, if we only have one cubic centimeter of air, about that much uh, cubed, then we have 188 million atoms of helium-3. So a factor of 600 times more. So what this mass spectrometer allows us to do is to make very precise isotopic measurements on next to nothing in terms of the amount of helium that we're able to collect in these olivines and in these uh, geothermal localities. So it's really quite a sensitive instrument to give us these ratios. Now, let's return back to Africa. And considerable work has, been, has, has gone on in Africa regarding helium isotopes all the way back to the 1970s and work done here at Scripps in the 1970s. When we look at the distribution down the middle part of Ethiopia, into the western rift and to the eastern rift, we look at the general picture of these helium isotope ratios. Now the high ratios, which um, are diagnostic of deep mantle, mantle plumes, are only found in Ethiopia and are not found in the so-called Kenyan Dome. Everything is less than this canonical value of mantle plumes. So when we look at a, a long strike variation, starting in the north, going down south. The Ethiopian dome has these very high ratios, 20 times the atmospheric value. But when we get to the Kenyan dome, we don't find these values. So this has spurned the idea that we have a mantle plume from the deep mantle impinging underneath the lithosphere in Ethiopia and forcing those uh, plates apart and contributing to the uplift, the Ethiopian dome. But what's going on with the Kenyan dome? We still have this area of uplift and volcanism. Why don't we find these high 3-4 ratios in, in Kenya? Um, the highest values are only eight times the atmospheric value. We don't actually find it. And this has given rise to ideas that there's only upper mantle convection in that, uh, in that asthenosphere. There's no mantle plume supporting the Kenyan Dome, which really doesn't make much sense given the, all the evidence uh, 
uh, presently available in terms of uplift and volcanism that we should have a mantle plume also beneath the Kenyan Dome. So this enigma, uh, we, we try to come up with a solution to this enigma by going to the Kenyan Dome. This is all the Inyo Lengai again, and we sampled just about everything we could get our hands on. We sampled xenoliths from all these different localities, and we measured helium in uh, olivines and clinopyroxenes. This is helium isotopes, and these are the typical ranges for the lithospheric mantle and the uppermost mantle. And those xenoliths from the Kenyan Dome fall exactly where we would anticipate them to fall, about six plus or minus one. So no evidence from the xenoliths as a mantle plume in, um, on the Kenyan Dome. Then we went after the geothermal samples. We went down to Rungwe Volcanic Province, which is the southernmost expression of volcanoes in the whole East African Rift. The rift terminates here. This is the so-called Eastern Rift or the Kenyan Rift. And this is the Western Rift. And it goes around this area called the uh, Tanzanian Craton, a really bit of old crust. So we sampled Rungwe Volcanic Province. These are the different volcanoes we visited, four different uh, active volcanoes. We sampled all the geothermal localities that we could possibly find. And we sampled gas samples and water samples over this quite large area. And again, we didn't find this elusive high 3-4 ratio signal, this fingerprint of the plumes. The highest value we measured was 7, all the way down to 1 RA. So, you know, maybe we were getting a bit disappointed. However, um, what we also sampled was lavas and scoria from all these different volcanoes. And these volcanoes uh, extruded lavas over different time intervals. These are quite young. They're called the Younger Extrusive Series. Uh, include, and these are much older, up to 7 million years old. So we had a very good spatial distribution of the different volcanoes and a very good temporal evolution of the volcanoes. So we sampled a total of 34 individual samples. And within those, um, sorry, 31 samples, within those 31 samples, sometimes we had olivines and we had clanoporoxines. So we had almost 50 odd samples where we're looking for this signal. This is what we found before. Remember the, uh, the xenoliths? Um, the waters are not pl plotted. But when we plot up the lavas, Eureka, we found it. We found values as high as 15 times the atmospheric value. So the, den the Kenyan Dome is really fingerprinted by a plume signal. So this was really quite a, uh, uh, a, a big discovery, at, at least in terms of the helium isotope community, that we had an explanation now for the Kenyan Dome. So Eureka, we found this signal. And we found it not in the xenoliths, but we found it in 17 out of these 31 different localities. So it's really quite extensive in time and in space. And indeed, some of the lavas gave us values up to eight times the atmospheric value. So if this is our baseline, everything that we sampled was lifted above that baseline by a contribution of plume-derived helium. So this is the, the first plot that I put up where the uh, which is conspicuously absent in terms of this high 3-4 signal. So why did people not find it before? Well, this database is weighted towards geothermal fluids. And as we, we saw, we didn't really find the, uh, the signal in geothermal fluids. Mineral data in this database is really quite limited. And the highest one that we've, we saw was about nine times the atmospheric value in the literature. So we more than doubled the amount of minerals which were sampled for helium. The lithology, the rock types in this region uh, and the, the reservoirs of the geothermal systems are, are really quite old rocks. They're Archaean or Precambrian, billions of years old. And those old rocks will have a lot of radiogenic helium-4 because it's produced as a function of time. And these meteoric waters which contribute to the geothermal systems really only tap the uppermost crust. So what we, we think is that the 3-4 ratios in this distribution are really skewed to reflect crustal values. And not really, we're not really uh, tackling what the mantle signal is.
And this fits in with the general idea of how a rift forms. So for example, this is an evolution from the bottom to the top. We have an initial perturbation from the plume, gradually works its way through the lithosphere and breaks the surface where we have oceanic crust formed. And the gases and the fluids in this part of the rift in the south, you know, you get the high ratios only in the olivines and in the clanopyroxenes. You don't get it in the fluids. But in this kind of region in Ethiopia and afar, we get the high 3-4 signal irrespective of what the type of sample that we take. So this is our revised map of what the helium isotope distribution in East Africa looks like. These are the very prominent high plateau dome areas, Ethiopia and Kenya. We see the Western Rift and the Kenyan Rift and the main Ethiopian Rift. These are the highest values that we find, 19.6. And down here in Rungwe, nearly 15 times the atmospheric value. So we think both these high plateau areas are supported isostatically by deep-seated mantle plumes hitting the surface. But when we draw circles around the, uh, the plateau regions, it gives rise to another question. How many plumes are there in Africa? Is this the situation where we have Kenya, Ethiopia, and into the Arabian Shield? We have distinctive plumes supporting the high plateau areas? Or do we have some kind of super plume where this super plume is just one entity in the mantle supporting the whole lot where we have some discontinuous regions as well. So this is the next question, and we're going to tackle that question with neon, which is the noble gas below helium in the periodic table. And it's exactly the same kind of approach. We use isotopes. And again, it's a balance of what was the neon isotopic composition when the Earth came together, and how has it changed through geological history? Well. When, we, uh, when the Earth formed during accretion, we caught primordial neon. And primordial neon is dominated by these two isotopes, neon-20 and neon-22, different numbers of neutrons. And we produce neon as well by nuclear reactions. This is a uh, oxygen um, atom. We have an alpha particle hitting an oxygen at atom to produce neon-21. So the difference between neon and helium is that neon has three isotopes, 20 and 22, which are primordial in origin. We've always had them. We produce only a little bit of them since, uh, since they were caught at accretion, but they're dominated by primordial isotopes. But in contrast, the neon 21 we have today has been produced throughout geological history. Because we have three isotopes, we've just got to handle them a little bit differently. And what we use is a three-isotope neon plot. So the, the, the primordial isotopes are 20 and 22. We just take the ratio. But this is the different one. The 21 is the one that grows with, with time. And on this plot, we have two boxes. Neon B is a type of neon that we find in meteorites. And it gives us a clue what the composition of that primordial neon was. So neon B plots here, we have a certain ratio, 12.5, and we have a certain ratio, 0.03. Now, very strangely, the Earth's atmosphere has a different composition of neon. It's much lower than the primordial value. Now, the difference between these two components could take up a whole lecture. I just want to make the case that they're different, and they probably uh, represent um, degassing of the solid Earth at the very beginning of Earth history. The important thing to note is they're different. Now, this isotope, which is the nucleogenic isotope, which has been growing in with time, if we start with that, then the only difference that the Earth will see in terms of neon isotopes would be growth of neon-21. So everything should lie along that line. However, because we go into the field and samples get contaminated with air, if we have any little bits of air in our sample, they will move towards this box over here. And again, it's just illustrative of the fact that isotopes are very useful. We have these straight lines between different isotope compositions to reflect mixing processes. So when we go to hotspots, like the Galapagos Island, 
like Iceland, like Luihi and Kilauea in Hawaii, all the samples line up on these dotted lines representing contamination by air of something which originally lay along those points there. So what we have is a very slight increase in the 21 to 22 ratio in these deep mantle uh, hotspots where we're sampling mantle plumes. Now, in contrast, when we sampled the upper mantle at ridges, in, in terms of the mid-ocean ridges, the neon has moved all the way over here. And if we contaminate from over here with there, they would fall along this line. So there's a huge difference between the lower mantle, sorry, the lower mantle which is here and the upper mantle which is there. And if we consider it for, for, for a little bit, all that, all that this difference reflects is that in these samples, in the lowermost mantle, we have a loss of primordial neon. And we've shifted it by addition of neon 21, but we only shifted it a little bit because there's a loss of primordial neon. In the uppermost mantle, which has been turning over throughout geological time, we've lost a lot of that primordial neon. So because we don't have much of it anymore, when we grow in the neon 21, it shifts it much further along the line to over here. So it's just the balance between the two different components of neon. Now, I did mention that air is a problem. We always contaminate samples with air, naturally. And what we do is when we have samples, we project up to a line and we come down here. So this point here represents the neon to 21 to 22 ratio without any air. So we're projecting up to the line and coming down here. So if we get rid of the air and we correct for the air, this is the corrected 21 to 22 ratio. Now, this box here represents what we found in Africa. I'm just changing the scale. It's exactly the same plot, the same trajectories up to these hotspots, the same trajectory over to the depleted mantle, the upper mantle. And then when we plot our samples from Ethiopia and the Western Rift, they fall over here on the hotspot trends. And when we sample Kenyan rifts, they plot over here, slightly different. So what we can say is, well, isn't that interesting? They, they don't look like the upper mantle. They look like plume mantle. They're looking, the neon's telling us it's coming from a, a deep in the earth, a mantle plume. But as we construct our trajectories from air all the way up to that neon 21 growth line, each individual sample will give us a different value for the extrapolated 21 to 22 ratio. So it looks like we have this whole range of 21, 22 ratios in these different samples, which might imply that we don't have one plume. We have lots of little plumes feeding the uh, Kenyan and the Ethiopian rifts. So I'm going to plot now this air-corrected extrapolated 21, 22 ratio against helium. So we've taken advantage of both these noble gases. And what happens when we plot these, we have fingerprints. This is the primordial helium uh, ratio, and this is the primordial neon ratio. The plume, 20 times the atmospheric value, and we can read off here 0.034 for the neon. Every one of these reservoirs in the mantle is fingerprinted by a unique helium and neon relationship. So the plumes from the deep mantle would be here, the uppermost mantle would be here, and the lithosphere would be here. So they're fingerprints in terms of helium and neon isotope space. Now, when we mix these reservoirs, if the plume mixes with the upper mantle, all the resultant mixtures would lie along this line here. So again, the beauty of isotopes is very kind of simple, with an R value of 1 which means that the ratio of helium to neon here is equal to the ratio of helium to neon in this end member. Now, let's imagine that the deep plume, the deep mantle, has a lot more neon. It's highly enriched in neon. So when we mix now, samples will fall along this line. So if we have a lot of neon in this end member, uh, we, we, we're contaminating DMM. Samples will fall along here at the 10% level, the 20% level. So we have this tremendous shift in neon isotopes with hardly any shift in helium. So this is a mixing trajectory based on the fact that the plume has a lot of neon. And if we mix the plume with the lithospheric mantle, we have the same story. 
And this number of 35 simply represents the enrichment of neon relative to helium here versus here. Where do our samples plot? Well, Ethiopia and Western Rift plot over here, very close to the plume end member, and compatible with mixing with the uppermost mantle, the DMM. And in contrast, the Kenyan rifts plot way over here. So this is very interesting. When we're in Kenya, we're getting a lot of our gases from that lithospheric mantle. Whereas when we move to Ethiopia, we get a lot of our gases from the uppermost mantle where the lithosphere has thinned. But the most important point is that irrespective of where we sample, they share a common end member. They share the plume. And that plume is fixed at one point only. So we have a unique fingerprint in our mixtures of helium and neon to tell us that we have the same plume. Now, this is a conceptual model, which is quite old. It's uh, how many? 16 years old, where we have this one big plume fed by from the lowermost mantle, which is interacting with the whole of the East African rift from the north to the south. In the south, in the Kenyan Dome, we're having to come through continental lithosphere. So we have the potential for contamination of the plume signal. Whereas in Ethiopia and in the Red Sea, that lithosphere is much thinner. So we have much less contamination. And indeed, we don't really have continental lithosphere. It's thinned enough that we only have oceanic lithosphere. So this common plume is one of the major take home messages of the helium and neon story, that we only have one plume. And when we turn to seismology, these are the rays our earthquake rays going through the solid earth. We're able to map out the structure of the mantle. This is simply because if we, parts of the mantle are slightly hotter than other parts of the mantle. So the hotter material, the rays traverse that mantle slightly slower than colder mantle. So we can map out the structure of the mantle. And what we have underneath East Africa is evidence of a superplume, the so-called African superplume, which originates below southern Africa, is tilted towards the north, and breaches the surface in East Africa, in the Kenyan Dome, and is continuous all the way to Ethiopia and the Ethiopian Dome. These are slices through this, in and out of the board. In the Kenyan Dome, we have this middle part, the, the Tanzanian Craton. We have the western and the eastern rifts, we can see that we have this hot material, which is um, traversing the uh, Tanzanian craton both to the, to the left and right, whereas in Ethiopia, it's simply sitting there beneath the whole of the uh, Ethiopian dome. So the seismology and the helium isotopes are coming together to tell us the same story. We have the high 3-4 ratios, the helium isotope evidence of one superplume um, supporting these high plateau areas. The Takana depression was, was a bit of a mystery. We've had rift in there, we've had thinning of the crust there, and as it's thinned, it uh, isostatically sinks deeper into the mantle. It's more dense than the surrounding dome, so we have this depression, but um, it doesn't represent any discontinu discontinuities in the superplume. And this is the image from the, um, the seismologist now, the superplume comes up from southern Africa and flows laterally underneath the whole of the East African rift. And that's what's basically forming the rift. And that's the information that we get from helium. And the helium-neon coupling tells us that it's a single plume. So the take-home message is that these high 3-4 ratios, which were a mystery previously, uh, particularly for the Kenyan Dome, was really an artifact. Um, so if a, we found these high 3-4 ratios in the Kenyan Dome, and now if a mantle plume supports the Ethiopian Dome, then this work implies that a similar plume mechanism supports the Kenyan Dome, based on these high 3-4 ratios that we find everywhere. They, the high 3-4 ratios in the Kenyan Dome were really masked by a veil of crustal or DMM or lithospheric helium, and we need this kind of sledgehammer approach of lots and lots of samples before we can actually find it. So we have a different sampling strategy now at other locations 
to find these high through four ratios. These coupled systematics are consistent with a one common plume source, and that one common plume supplies the entire East African rift. And it's likely that the superplume is the source of both heat and magnetism, and indeed dynamic support of these high plateau throughout eastern Africa. So the whole action's in the mantle, and now we're begin, beginning to see a picture of the mantle. I'd just like to acknowledge all these individuals who contributed to this work, in particular, Sami Halderson, who uh, uh, studied East Africa for his PhD thesis, and indeed, in two days' time, he's going to defend his PhD thesis in part on this African work. So these are our Scripps colleagues, colleagues from around the world which contributed to the, uh, the fieldwork in particular, and a big acknowledgement to the National Science Foundation who funded all this work. So uh, I'd like to finish there, and I'd be very happy to try and answer some of your questions. Thank you. The question is, um, how does these deep-seated plumes interact with the overriding plates? Um, the African plate is moving in a northerly tra tra trajectory, and we have these underlying plumes which are making their way through the lithosphere. So it's slightly different from Hawaii, where we have the seamount series. Uh, we have a stationary plume. This plume is also um, evolving and, and moving. We can see the tilt very clearly in the seismology. But there is a, um, an aspect of the plates interacting with the plume and producing some kind of, um, well, I wouldn't say time series like Hawaii, because there's not this gradual time series. But it's so huge, it's unlike Hawaii, which is a single point source. This thing's massive, that it's erupting simultaneously in different parts of the East African Rift. That because the Atlantic, mid -Atlant the Atlantic Ocean is spreading on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, yeah. and you've got the spreading of the East African Rift, what's yeah. happening to the continent of Africa? Well, that's a good question, because you'd expect from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we, we have C4 spreading, and we have movement towards Africa. So you would expect that whole plate to move laterally to the east. But what we have is it's against the Indian Ocean plate. So in those kind of circumstances, we can probably have one of two things happening. We could have a subduction where we're going to lose plate underneath another plate. Alternatively, we have some readjustment of the locations of the plates. So we have kind of gradual movement of the kind of the jigsaw of the plates and without any subduction. So um, in the particular case of the African plate, what's going to happen is that we're going to produce a rift. We're going to have a new ocean there. We're going to have two new plates laterally moving apart and Africa breaking into two over the next, I don't know, 20, 50 million years or so, <laughs> and um, beyond our time here. And um, it's a good question. I'd like to see the forward modeling of what's going to happen to these plates. I don't know what the answer is. I don't do that kind of thing. Well, interesting. Good question. The, um, the question's about other locations, other plumes. Do we have the same kind of signatures? Well, in general, we do. We have these high helium isotope ratios in Hawaii. They're much higher than we get in East Africa. They're about 35 times the atmospheric value in Hawaii, whereas the highest we've measured in East Africa is 20. So they will have slightly different helium isotopes and neon isotopes. And I've only really discussed two of the noble gases. We could look at the argon isotopes as well, and maybe the xenon isotopes. So they will be slightly different, reflecting you know, their origin and their different mixture histories in the mantle and how they interact with the overlying lithosphere. So all those contribute to slightly different signals. We're trying to get rid of the lithospheric signal and see the mantle signal. And indeed, we may have in Hawaii a greater proportion of the primordial to the radiogenic uh, isotopes. So they will be unique in that respect. 